This democratic fixation on Russia is now resulting in a criminal process, a very serious one, charging American citizens who are lifelong political activists, leftist anti-war activists of the kind of old left that opposes U.S. imperialism, that of course is going to be opposed to a NATO war in Europe in order to weaken Russia. And because these citizens, all of whom belong to this black left-wing socialist party, are outspoken opponents of Joe Biden's policy in the war in Ukraine, the Biden Justice Department decided to charge them with the felony of being agents of the Kremlin and failing to file the required forms on the flimsiest basis imaginable. Here's the AP reporting on the indictment when it was first unveiled in April. The U.S. charges four Americans and three Russians an election discord case. Quote, the four Americans are all part of the African People's Socialist Party and a Huru movement, which has locations in St. Petersburg, Florida, and St. Louis. Among those charged is Amali Yeshalita, chairman of the U.S.-based organization, which was raided by the FBI last summer when the Russian also accused Yanov was originally charged. Much of the alleged cooperation involves support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In, a March, 20, in March 2022, Yeshitela held a news conference in which he said, quote, the African People's Socialist Party calls for unity with Russia and its defensive war in Ukraine against the world's colonial powers. He also called for the independence of the Russian-occupied Donetsk region, Donetsk region in eastern Ukraine. Now, feel free to disagree with that view. I've never argued the Russians are justified, but when I had Norman Finkelstein on my show, he actually yelled at me for only limiting myself to opposing U.S. support for Ukraine, telling me that if I really believed all the arguments I was making, which he does, namely that NATO is purposely expanding as uh, much up to the Russian border eastward as possible in a way to deliberately threaten and provoke the Russians, that you should have to believe that the Russians were justified in that invasion. That's a position that he believes, that it was, the, that was, was NATO and the U.S. who provoked the war. You can disagree with that. But the fact that Norman Finkelstein believes that is completely unsurprising to me, given how consistent it is with everything he's argued his whole life. If someone were to try and tell me that he was only advocating that because he was a Russian agent, I would laugh in their face. It's so obvious that that's a view he reached through his own intellectual autonomy. It's the natural byproduct of his ideology. And the same is true for this left-wing party. It would be shocking if they did anything other than side with Russia against NATO, given their five-decade history of opposing U.S. foreign policy from the left. And yet, here's the, Justice, the Department of Justice, the Office of Public Affairs, announcing their indictment, quote, U.S. citizens and Russian intelligence officers charged with conspiring to use United States citizens as illegal agents of the Russian government. Defendants sought to sow discord, spread pro-Russia propaganda, and interfere in elections within the United States. Now, we have seen for seven years how dangerous these concepts are of every time you say something that aligns with Russian interest, even if that's not your motive, you get accused of being a pro-Russian propagandist. In fact, we've deconstructed studies before that accused acts of allowing pro-Russian propaganda when all they meant by that is anybody who says anything that promotes the interests of the Russian government. So if you don't want the United States government to fund the war in Ukraine, which is every bit your right as an American citizen to advocate, it, of course, is a view that aligns with the interests of the Russian government. That doesn't mean that you're acting on behalf of the Russian government or at its behest or at its direction. Anything that you argue might happen to align with the interests of Russia. People who opposed coups and cold wars in the, in, during the Cold War in the name of fighting the Soviet Union were advocating views that might have aligned with Russian interests, it didn't mean they were agents of the Kremlin. Here's the DOJ's press release. Quote, a federal grand jury in Tampa, Florida, returned a superseding indictment charging four U.S. citizens and three Russian nationals with working on behalf of the Russian government and in conjunction with the FSB to conduct a multi-year foreign malign influence campaign in the United States. 
Among other conduct, the indictment alleges that the Russian defendants recruited, funded, and directed U.S. political groups to act as unregistered illegal agents of the Russian government and sow discord and spread pro-Russian propaganda. The indicted intelligence officers in particular participated in covertly funding and directing candidates for local office within the United States. Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service allegedly weaponized our First Amendment rights. Freedom Russia denies to its own citizens to divide Americans and interfere in elections in the United States, said the Assistant Attorney General responsible for this indictment. This department will not hesitate to expose and prosecute those who sow discord and corrupt U.S. elections in service of foreign interests, regardless of whether the culprits are U.S. citizens or foreign individuals abroad. If you look in the indictment, other than the receipt over six years of a trivial sum of money by this party, $7,000 over six years, that the U.S. government alleges not came not from Russians, but Russians affiliated with the Russian government, the entire indictment is based entirely and exclusively on the political activism and the political advocacy of this party and its members. And it's trying to criminalize their political opinion, to criminalize their dissent against the U.S. government. And what's amazing is there was so little coverage of this case, in part because right-wing media were reluctant to rise in defense of a black left-wing socialist party. And then there were a lot of liberals who were reluctant to rise and criticize the Biden Justice Department. One of the people who actually covered the case at the time and denounced it vehemently was Glenn Beck. But the only person with a corporate media job, a corporate media platform, who covered this case and denounced it was the white nationalist Tucker Carlson. I say white nationalist in quotes because it is gospel in liberal discourse that he is a racist and a white nationalist, and yet he is the only one out of all of them willing to rise in defense of the constitutional rights of these black American leftists. I went on a show to talk about the case, but he also uh, did his monologues on it and called on his show the leader of this party and had a very amiable conversation with him. Here's part of what he said but not anymore. According to the indictment, the criminals in question, quote, wrote articles that contained Russian propaganda and disinformation. Huh? They also gave speeches and posted videos that annoyed the State Department. Here's one of them. There's a discussion about Russian military border uh, buildup uh, on its border uh, with Ukraine and how this represents a terrible threat uh, uh, to Ukraine by, uh, by Russians. Uh, but there is no acknowledgement of the history uh, that took us to this place, how the U.S. overthrew, uh, uh, participated in <clears throat> facilitating the overthrow of a government in Ukraine that was friendly to the Soviet Union. Nor does it talk about the history of this relationship between Ukraine and, and Russia. This is an ongoing aggression. It did not just start. It's, all, it's been going on for a while, but the U.S. government uh, uh, relies on the ignorance of, uh, of the people uh, in this country and much of the world that's facilitated by people like Zuckerberg. So for whatever it's worth, we're not really sure who that guy is. We know he's American. Pretty sure that on a lot of issues, we likely would not agree with him. A lot of what he just said in that video seems to be true. But even if it weren't true, even if he was wrong, it would still be constitutionally protected speech. In a free country, which we had until recently, you are allowed by definition to have dumb opinions. Most of us do, but not anymore. So that man you just saw is facing 10 years behind bars for expressing views about Ukraine that the Biden administration doesn't want to hear. That's terrifying. Does no one else think that's terrifying? It is terrifying. And to that man's credit, whoever he is, he saw it coming. Here he is at a rally last month. They have declared that black people are so stupid that it takes Russians to tell us that we are oppressed. I have never known a moment of black freedom for my entire life. I have never read of a moment since the beginning of a colonial mode of production where black people have been free. And yet they are saying that we are working, we are agents of some foreign power because we say black people must be free. 
Okay, again, we're not defending that guy because we agree with all of his views. We probably don't. That is totally irrelevant. Whether you agree with what someone is saying has nothing to do with his right to say it. Americans are allowed to say what they think is true, period. So much. Greenwald is the host of... It is really remarkable that we got to the point where the only person in corporate media, on television, or in major newspapers willing to stand in defense of the free speech rights of a black left-wing anti-war socialist group is Tucker Carlson. But that is the society in which we live. Neoliberals and Democrats have zero belief in free speech. Zero. If you look at the indictment, here it is the indictment, the uh, superseding indictment. Uh, it's from January of uh, January 2nd, 2024, uh, you see the, uh, I actually think this is the court ruling, if I'm not mistaken, um, where the defendants uh, actually filed a motion asking for dismissal of this case on the grounds that everything they're accused of doing is protected by the First Amendment. When you file a motion to dismiss before it goes to trial or anything else, you basically say, we're going to assume for the sake of argument that everything the government alleges that we did is something that we in fact did. And the argument was, even if we did everything the government says we did, it is still cannot be a crime because everything we did is protected by the First Amendment. And yet the magistrate judge decided that they would not dismiss this case, meaning it's likely to go to trial, and essentially had an argument about free speech that was work beyond belief in terms of what the free speech clause actually permits. Here is part of what the court said, quote, by the motion, defendants argue the superseding indictment should be dismissed on First Amendment free speech grounds because the superseding indictment directly targets political speech and the law with which they're charged is unconstitutional as applied. Now, the law that they're charged with doesn't say it's illegal to be a foreign agent of, a, of the, the Russian government or any other government. It says that if you're acting on behalf of a foreign government, you have to file a disclosure form, the FARA disclosure form, that identifies yourself as being that, and that they fail to do so. Now, this is the kind of law that they almost never invoke against anybody, but they suddenly decided to do so when they wanted to prosecute people like Paul Manafort. This is the kind of law that they dragged out and the court goes on, quote, the United States contends that Section 951 targets Demo Democrats' conduct rather than speech and is constitutional as applied under an intermediate scrutinary standard. On September 28, 2023, this court held a hearing on the matter. Based upon the party's briefs and the overall record, the undersigned finds that defendants' arguments must fail at this time and therefore recommends that defendants' motion be denied. What the court essentially said, and just to hear it, doesn't even pass the laugh test, is that there was nothing ideological or political about this prosecution. In other words, if this had been, say, a standard pro-Biden liberal group that loved Ukraine and flew the Ukraine flag and was highly supportive of the U.S. role in Ukraine and cheered Biden for doing it, but met with Ukrainians and over the course of six years received some trivial sum of money, the court, the Biden Justice Department would have prosecuted them too. And that it's therefore a viewpoint neutral prosecution having nothing to do with the First Amendment. Anyone who believes that or who purports to believe that is either incredibly naive or a blatant liar. Of course the reason this prosecution was brought was because these people are dissidents, they're anti-establishment dissidents and they're critics of the Biden administration's foreign policy and its role in Ukraine. And they're getting called Russian agents, not because they're incapable of thinking for themselves or forming anti-war ideas without being told by Russian officials what to say and think, which is the rather condescending and insulting premise of this indictment, but instead because the United States government, especially under the Biden administration, sees anybody who opposes their policies and their wars, especially the ones pertaining to Ukraine, as being a Russian agent. And because 
The leader of this party had traveled to Russia, something that's very legal to do, I've done it twice, and received $7,000 over the course of six years in donations from people they say were linked to the Russian government, and then made statements, political statements, of exactly the type you would expect a person like this, given his long history of activism, to say, this is an 81-year-old man who was raided by the FBI with guns pointed at him and his wife in the early morning, even though he obviously poses a threat to nobody. The type of prosecution this is is very recognizable. It's one to criminalize dissent and to scare everybody in the United States from understanding that if they, too, oppose the U.S. government's efforts with regard to Russia, they can be criminally prosecuted as being a Russian agent. This is not a new tactic. It was done throughout the entire Cold War. It culminated and found its most disgraceful expression in the McCarthy era, but it has been completely rejuvenated for different ends and primarily by Democrats and neoliberals. So we sat down right before the show live uh, just to accommodate them and their time, and we spoke with the chairman of this party, uh, Amali Yeshil uh, Tella, and his lawyer, Leonard Goodman, who, as I said, is a criminal defense lawyer. He's also an adjunct professor of law at DePaul, who has taken on the case pro bono uh, because he, he understands, as Tucker Carlson does, the free speech rights that are being attacked for everybody. Imagine if this government can, if the government can win this case, and if they can prove that you said things that they believe is pro-Russian propaganda, which means basically everything that criticizes the Democratic Party, or that you intended to do so with the, the attempt, the intent to influence the election, which is every bit the right of an American citizen to do, that they now have a legal foundation to accuse you of being an agent of a foreign power. It is hard to overstate the threat that this poses to the free speech rights and First Amendment rights, and even if they ultimately win, they're going to have huge costs. Even though their lawyer is acting pro bono to his great credit, there's all kinds of costs with having to get expert witnesses. The government intends to bring expert witnesses to testify about how disinformation works. You can imagine what kind of people those are going to be. So during the interview, and we're going to post uh, at the end of the show as well, how you can contribute to their legal defense fund, which I hope you will. It'll also be in the description in the in the video and uh uh, they both give that information, but this is a serious case, even though you might think this is a, it is a small party, it's a fringe party, but the case itself is very serious. And one of the strategies governments use is they purposely bring the case against people who you might feel a little bit uncomfortable by aligning with or defending. I actually found him to be incredibly well-spoken, you get a very clear sense of exactly what he is, of the political movement out of which he emerged in the 1960s. He's very rational. He's very thoughtful. The idea that he's a puppet being told to oppose the war in Ukraine simply because Russian officials are telling him to is something that I think you'll instinctively realize is not even plausible. And Mr. Goodman, his lawyer, makes a very strong case as well about why this case is incredibly frivolous. Frivolous though it is, it is very dangerous, and so we intend to keep reporting on it. And here's the interview that we conducted just a few moments before we started our live show, both with the chairman of the African uh, People's Socialist Party, who faces 15 years in prison, and his lawyer, Leonard Goodman. Gentlemen, good evening. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight, I think your case is so important and I'm really happy for the opportunity to talk with you about it. Um, and if you don't mind, let me begin with uh, Chairman Yeshitala because I wanna understand a little bit, or I want the audience to understand a little bit more about the African People's Socialist Party, which is at the heart of this prosecution. It's an organization of which you're the chairman. You've been at it for a long time. So just tell us a little bit about the history of the party. When was it formed and in what ideology or for what reasons was the party created? Well, the party was formed uh, formally in 1972, uh, but uh, I was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, uh, that made uh, a significant uh, move within the civil rights movement within 1966 to call for black power. And uh, this was a major change in development of the civil rights movement itself, where a, a, a one trend of our movement, uh, which is historical, has 
been uh, there all along, uh, uh, move toward uh, actual accomplishment, accomplishing self-determination as opposed to simply trying to integrate into uh, American society. And uh, based on uh, the struggle uh, to be able uh, to uh, have self-reliance, feed, clothe, uh, house ourselves, uh, just be a self-reliant people. And so uh, in 1972, after many years of involvement, first with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, um, I spent time in prison uh, for, uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, for having removed a horrible offensive uh, mural that was on the city hall wall, uh, an eight by 10 foot mural there that depicted African people in grotesque caricature. And after pleading with the mayor for a while, I led a demonstration in City Hall that resulted uh, ultimately uh, in our uh, taking the mural down uh, from the wall uh, and was uh, sentenced to five years in prison for that act after having been uh, charged with 11 different offenses and uh, spent time in prison as a consequence of that in and out of prison for a while. Um, uh, got out of prison on bond or on the actually the uh, uh, the four days before the assassination of Martin Luther King, uh, I participated in a demonstration in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, uh, and, uh, and on my way to Florida on the Greyhound bus, I, I arrived and, and learned uh, that King had been killed. The demonstration I was going there to attend uh, was uh, to help uh, defend uh, some young African men, black men, uh, who had been in prison uh, there. And uh, when I got there, King learned King had been killed, and the demonstration, the character of the demonstration changed, uh, revolving around his assassination. I was arrested there, one of the first persons, the, one of the first two persons uh, who was arrested on a law that had just been created uh, called uh, Inciting to Riot, that riot that did not require a riot to occur. It, uh, simply, it was a thought crime in, in that it required uh, me to have wanted a riot to occur after having made a speech. So I spent, uh, you know, some time in jail uh, through that. And, and uh, in the process of all of this, uh, uh, we concluded uh, after a period that it was not good enough just to be involved in protest, that we had to be able to build a, a movement that was about uh, achieving power of our lives and determined that, uh, that the best vehicle for doing that was a political party. That was the basis for the founding of the uh, African People's Socialist Party. And at some juncture uh, during this work, we also concluded uh, that the struggle of black people in this country was part of a much broader struggle of black people around the world, uh, that it began when we were first uh, introduced uh, into this country, that is say black people uh, at gunpoint. And so we uh, uh, began a movement to connect uh, the struggle of Africans here with Africans everywhere and uh, with the struggle of colonized peoples around the world. And so that's kind of sort of, uh, you know, the history of, of, and motivation of, uh, of the African People's Socialist Party and of me. Yeah, so I mean, that last point that you made is a crucial part of uh, really why I asked what I think connects so much to this case. Typically on Martin Luther King Day, what has become this federal holiday, I often feature what, for me, was, I think, one of his most interesting speeches given uh, in Harlem exactly a year to the date before he was killed in 1967, where he explained why he had come to the conclusion that domestic activism on racism and racial equality was insufficient. Why? Similar to what you just said, it was inextricably yes. uh, linked to questions of U.S. foreign policy, U.S. behavior in the world, and in particular in that moment. For him, that meant opposition to the war in Vietnam. It was something where he kind of expanded his focus to the consternation of a lot of liberals at the time, where he began focusing on anti-war activism. And of course, in the 60s and the 70s, anti-war activism was often linked with the American left, although there were parts of the American right that were more isolationist, but largely it was viewed as a left-wing cause. Interestingly, at least when it comes to certain wars like the NATO-US war in Ukraine against Russia, opposition to that war has now gotten cast as almost a right-wing cause, which is very bizarre to me. I presume it's pretty bizarre to you too, having been at this for even longer. And 
In cases like the one that you're currently involved in, where the question is, is somebody acting as an agent of a foreign government? Typically, when I think of someone who's acting as an agent of a foreign government, that to me is somebody who's like a lobbyist, somebody who's saying things that they don't believe because they're being paid to say them or to work on behalf of a foreign government. In this case, in the case of your advocacy against US involvement in Ukraine, or even your advocacy where you end up citing uh, on the side of Russia in certain controversies, do you see that as consistent with the activism and ideology that you've been pursuing and defending for decades? It's, it's very much uh, consistent with it. The fact is that, uh, uh, that it's very uh, disingenuous for the United States government to charge us of uh, not having agency, uh, that we're working on behalf of a foreign government. Uh, uh, the fact is that uh, I uh, was in, in, in Belfast, Ireland in 1983 and uh, working uh, in solidarity uh, with the Irish people in opposition to British colonialism. Uh, I, uh, put, I was in Nicaragua uh, in, uh, at the t at time of the Reagan uh, inauguration in opposition to U.S. Paul in solidarity. Uh, with the people of Nicaragua, who had just won their uh, their their freedom, uh, uh, despite the policies of the United States government. In fact, uh, it was a time of extreme turmoil that uh, even changed some policies of the United States government in terms of how it would characterize people like me, uh, who were talking about uh, freedom and uh, had determined that. Uh, that uh, people who were engaged uh, in struggles like uh, in, in, in Nicaragua and people, uh, El Salvador that had emerged uh, would no longer be, a, it wouldn't be tolerated in terms of calling them freedom fighters, they would be characterized as terrorists. And so I was in, in Spain, invited to speak in Spain uh, by an NGO that uh, was supported by the Spanish government. I was there in 2007. And when I spoke there, I spoke also in opposition uh, to U.S. policies that were impacting on peoples around the world. I was invited to speak at Oxford Union, and I spoke there in 2019. And I opened my presentation in 2019, expressing uh, 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 solidarity uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the government of, uh, of uh, Venezuela that, at the time, was uh, being challenged by United States policy as well. So this is historically what we've been about. And so this whole notion uh, that somehow uh, we become an employee of Russia, uh, because I visited Moscow uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and got marching orders uh, some, you know, uh, from Moscow at that point, that's re been responsible uh, for the fact that we ran and participated in uh, uh, elections, not, not, not gun battles, but elections, participated in elections in St. Petersburg, Florida for mayor, for uh, for city council, 2017, 2019, we ran candidates on reparations and things like that, that suddenly uh, we are learning uh, is a consequence of a relationship to Russia and not uh, due to the agency of black people. And uh, even the whole nonsense about uh, Russia hiring us to talk about genocide. I mean, uh, we held a convention, uh, a tribunal uh, uh, on reparations for black people in the United States in 1982 in New York City and uh, used uh, international law as a basis for that. And one of those laws was the UN Convention on the uh, Punishment uh, uh, and, and on, on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. So it's disingenuous. There's nothing that we're doing now uh, that we haven't been doing for the last 50 years. Yeah, I mean, it's so bizarre, you know, you can go back decades, of course, of the Cold War, and it found its most disgraceful expression in the McCarthy era, where the U.S. government, the U.S. security state, would routinely accuse American citizens who dissented from the policies, the war policies of the U.S. government, of being in somehow in cahoots with the Kremlin, or disloyal, or an agent of the Kremlin. And it's really bizarre to watch that be rejuvenated, even after the ideology of Russia has changed so radically, albeit often by the Democratic Party, the kind of neoliberal order. Just this week, we saw a suggestion from Nancy Pelosi that anti-Israel or pro-Palestinian protesters might be somehow connected to the Kremlin and they ought to be investigated. This kind of paranoia that we hadn't seen for decades. Before I get to your counsel, Mr. Goodman, talk about a couple of the technical aspects of, of your case and where it is. I just want to ask you one last question, which is, or for now, I mean, um, which is, I have seen videos of you speaking before your arrest, before this indictment, where you seemed 
to be almost anticipating that there would be accusations of this kind launched at you or that there would be some kind of case brought against you. Is that a correct perception? And if, uh, did this indictment come as a big surprise to you to hear that you were actually being criminally accused by the Biden Justice Department of being agents of the Russian government? It was surprising in, in terms of uh, when it happened and how it happened, because it was a very violent attack on my home, uh, uh, threatened my life, threatened the life of my wife. A tremendous amount of resources were stolen, properties damaged and things like that. And uh, it was a pre dawn raid. And so we were surprised by that. But the history of our struggle, I mean, they raided my home at 5 o'clock a.m. Uh, but uh, when I uh, came at their command, uh, uh, out of my house um, and with my hands up as they commanded and faced uh, armored uh, vehicles and assault uh, 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 weapons carrying uh, camouflage uh, donned men who were pointing uh, these weapons and, and with the laser targeting devices bouncing off my chest. It, what came to my mind was uh, uh, 1969 uh, when in December, when uh, the FBI raided the home of, uh, or they assisted the uh, attack on the home of uh, Fred Hampton in Chicago, uh, where he was assassinated. And so I thought I was going to die when I walked out of that house. Uh, so uh, uh, and my point being is that uh, the treatment of uh, people like me uh, who uh, moved uh, from a particular politic that uh, has prevailed for a long time uh, in this country, especially since uh, there are people like King and Malcolm X and Fred Hampton and others have been assassinated. Uh, uh, there is that history and there is that tradition. So I'm not surprised that the U.S. government attacked me. We have an incredible program where we've done uh, incredible projects, particularly in the city of St. Louis, where, I mean, the actual redeveloped uh, much of the north side of uh, of uh, St. Louis, which is a predominantly African community that's been left to deteriorate, uh, and not just deteriorate, but a policy that they characterize as benign neglect has been, been imposed on this community. And so uh, this is the work that we've been doing, and we knew that it wasn't something that the government was happy with, but that the population, the community was happy with. So I'm not, I'm not surprised. And, and, and we expect, uh, I guess, to be attacked by the government, but not because we violated a crime. And this is the thing that makes this extraordinarily interesting to us, is that we find ourselves in a position of having to fight uh, in defense of a U.S. Constitution and the right to free speech against the very government that says it's about free speech and that's upholding the Constitution and against the institutions like FBI uh, and the presidency of this country that's supposed to be upholding the Constitution. I think they even have to take vows to that effect. That effect. And so here we are as an organization has come to the conclusion some time ago that we have to be free uh, from the, uh, the colonial domination of the United States government uh, in a position fighting fiercely and have fought fiercely uh, for uh, the rights of free speech as according to the Constitution, freedom of assembly according to the Constitution and that kind of thing. So no, uh, uh, yes, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, shocked. Uh, by the attack. Uh, as I said, the way the attack occurred on this occasion was shocking, unexpected, and uh, pre-dawn, uh, my wife and I sitting up uh, at the table, she and her being preparing to come to our, our headquarters here in St. Louis uh, to preside over a program that we are training uh, black women uh, as doulas to, uh, to be able to help uh, uh, women and children uh, have safe births in a city that has uh, uh, a situation where enough black babies die every year to fill 15 uh, kindergarten classes. And this is what we were preparing. We were talking about this when this, this, this noise came out of, out of the dark, uh, telling us to come up with our hands up and flashbang grenades exploding all around, ultimately coming into the house uh, and things like that. And then to be confronted with this armed force out there. That was uh, that was a surprise. <laughs> so no, I don't. I, mean, I don't blame you. I think that you know a lot of people don't understand the amount of force that the federal government brings without the slightest consideration of whether or not there's any actual threat posed. This is not a case, even if you want to believe all the allegations involving any accusation of violence or any kind of use of force. Um, it's clearly a political case at its core. Um, at best, a kind of argument that you 
violated technical parts of the law by failing to register as a foreign agent to, to, to treat American citizens that way um, is, I think, something that people don't quite realize how often it happens until they actually go through it, which is a great segue uh, for me to ask you. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.